Okay. Uh, so welcome, uh, welcome everyone, and um, uh, we we have um two selections by the professor uh to Schutenberg uh from MIT. Um, so they want to say okay. Okay. So it looks like okay, so it's really a, a rare and uh, valuable opportunity. So let uh let let me um not waste time and uh, quickly give that thought. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to give two lectures today on Bayesian learning. And so the motivation for these lectures is that there's been a bunch of uh, recent work on this specified learning that I think is pretty interesting. I'll talk about some of that this afternoon, but to really understand it, it helps to understand some of the more basic results on learning and probability theories that it builds on. So lecture today is more of a um, review, some review, um, and explain um, the underpinnings of some of this literature. Um, okay, so this is based on classes I give at MIT. And in many of my classes, I'm in a big hurry to state economic results. So I state a result and I name a theorem. And here's a theorem, and if this is true, I don't really explain why the theorem works or anything. So understand the specified learning it's helpful to actually know how the proofs work, not just the statements of the theorems. So I'm going to do more on proofs than usual in an economics class. Um, I'm going to start off with a very detailed proof of a very simple but fundamental result on the consistency of Bayesian learning and try and spell out all the steps. Of it. And then as we get through the, uh, the lecture, I'll do more advanced things and get less detail. So it might get harder to follow. I, tend to talk too quickly, um, even for native English speakers. So, um, but I don't mind being slowed down. So if anything isn't clear or if I go too fast, so please ask, please ask questions. As I said, there's much too much important probability theory to cover in two lectures. So it's just a snippet. I'm not saying this is all that's important. So this is that amount of material I think I can handle today. So I'm gonna start with the, um, Consistency of Bayesian learning. So the standard result in Bayesian learning is that it's consistent. But in the long run, the beliefs of the Bayesian agent concentrate around the truth, true probability model. That requires that the agent's prior beliefs are, quote, correctly specified. And, and I'll give a formal definition of that, but Basically, what it means is that your prior at least allows the truth. If your prior assigns zero probability to a neighborhood of a true model, there's no amount of data that can let you learn the true model. But Bayesian consistency holds quite generally, but I think the key facts about it can be seen in a very easy special case with a finite support prior. Bayesian thinks it's only a finite number of different mm -hmm. models that could be true. And they're correctly specified means the prior assigns strictly positive probability to the true model. Okay, if we had a continuum of models in the prior, then it'd be a more complicated set of results about a neighborhood of, of truth and so on. I'm also going to simplify it for now by assuming that the data generating process, the agent sees, is exogenous. So not influenced by what the agent does and IID. So the a finite set of things the agent can see, capital Y. Okay. So we're gonna have the sequences of Y, Y1, Y2, it's just the things the agent could see. The true model is IID and is described by a time invariant probability measure theta bar. It's a distribution on Y. When I write capital delta, I just mean the space of probability measures on a set. So delta of Y is the probability measures on Y. So to note, the, if the true model is state of R, that's gonna generate a distribution on the data on infinite sequences of Y. And to note this true probability distribution by uh, calligraphic P of Data bar. Okay. 
agent as um, a set of models they think are possible. The set theta k, of, sorry, it's a set of models, small theta, indexed by k. So I'll call the collection of these models capital theta. Yeah? And each of these theta k's corresponds to some probability measure over these different sequences of outcomes. And there's an initial false support belief in you not. The doesn't know what the truth data is. But importantly, um, you have full support. So every element of capital theta has positive probability. And the true model theta hat is in the set capital theta. So it doesn't know the true model's right, but they think it is possible. Okay. And it's going to make a, a strong assumption again here to make things extra simple and be relaxed. But assume that the true model theta hat and any theta k are mutually absolutely continuous. So if some y has true positive probability, all the models the agent considers thinks it as positive probability. And if the agent thinks, if some theta k thinks y is possible, then it actually is possible. Okay? So this ensures that Bayesian updating is always well defined and also means that no one observation can tell the agent that can't be the model because this couldn't have happened under my model. So with this assumption, Bayesian updating induces a well-defined stochastic process of beliefs. The agent has seen outcomes y1, y2, y3, up to yt. The posterior probability they give to model theta k is, well, what's the probability we would have seen the sequence of data if the truth was theta k? So that's this. With prior of theta k comes the probability of the sequence under theta k. And on the denominator, it's the total probability we could have seen the sequence of outcomes. So we take the sum over all the different theta j that are possible, mu naught of theta j times the probability sequence of so that theta j. This is just a base rule. All good? Okay. Theorem. The posterior probability of a true model converges to one almost surely. So the limit as t goes to zero, the agent gives to the state of hat is one. Almost surely with respect to the true data generating process. Okay. So this is an old result. I, I've done my homework correctly. This is due to do in 49. And we're going to prove this to understand what happens. We're really interested in what happens when the agent's not correctly specified. The data hat's not in the prior, but first we're going to see what happens when they are correctly specified. Okay, so for any model theta k that's not the true model, let w super k sub tau of the history y tau be the log likelihood ratio of model k with respect to the true distribution. So it's the log of theta k of y tau over theta hat of y tau. So the logarithm function is strictly concave. And so if theta k was theta hat, we'd have log of one to zero. We have a constant. But because Theta k is not theta hat, this ratio isn't a constant. Okay? So then we can appeal to Jensen's inequality and said that the expected value of wk is less than the log of the expect log of the expectation of the exponent of wk. Nothing fancy there. <laughs> And see someone's taking notes. That's excellent. Yeah, so yeah, I, that's, yeah. that's I will try and go slowly enough. You have a chance to. If, okay, if, great. There's lots of research that shows taking notes helps people remember. Things. So I'm too lazy to do it myself usually, but I I applaud it when people. Okay. Yeah. Now the true probability of outcome y is theta hat y. I the definition of theta hat, 
So the expectation with respect to the true process of expectation of this WK. So it's the expectation of this ratio, which is one. Okay? So we have this equation one. Substituting into one says that the expectation of W1K is less than log of one, so it's negative. Okay? And the absolute continuity assumption implies we aren't taking log of zero, so this expectation of W1K is finite. It's more than minus infinity. Good. Since the yt are iid, independent, identically distributed, the w super k are also iid. So why do they go through all this? Well, this is finite and this is bounded above because I want to appeal to the strong law of large numbers. Yeah, so we have this sequence of id things that are bounded below and bounded above. So with probably one average value of the Time average of a W is the limit t goes to infinity of the sum WK over T equals the expected value, which is one. Okay. Good. Well, if the average is converging to one, then the sum, it's just t times the average, is converging to minus infinity. Good. So why, what happened there? Where the minus infinity? So this, you know, this thing is negative. Good. Right, so the probability that this equals this is one. This is a negative number. So we have each period we have a negative number, the average is negative, so the sum is minus infinity. That's that's this. Almost done. Let z super k be the likelihood ratio between model theta k and the true model given what you've seen up to time t. So it's just uh, find the product from one to t, the ratio theta k to theta half. And by definition, so it's, you know, it's just exponent of logs. So I can take exponent of a log of the product is where I started with this. So the limit of these z's, it's the limit of the exponent of the sum of the logs. And that's this thing we call, so this exponent of log thing is what we call the, the w's. And we said that this yeah, was converging to minus infinity. Exponent of minus infinity is zero. So the limit of the, the posterior probability between theta k and the true model goes to zero. That's what we wanted to show. For anything that's not the true model, the ratio goes to zero. Therefore, all the probability has to go in the true model. Okay? So it's okay. so many steps of algebra, but nothing right, seems to spawn a lot of large numbers. And that was it. There's no fancy probability theory. Okay. Well, So far, I defined a model to be a point in the space of distributions delta y. Instead, we could the models be indexed by some abstract parameter theta and have a map where each theta has some p theta. Mm -hmm. Then we can ask, 
is the model identified. Are we different models identified? Identifiability, so if we have the same distribution on Ys, for what we're calling model theta one and model theta two, you couldn't hope to tell them apart. Okay. Now, what I've shown you so far is what the data process is exogenous. With endogenous signals, you're gonna have to pay attention to what isn't, isn't, isn't identified, right? If you think, for example, of the bandit problem, you play left or right, if you always play left, you won't see data on what happens if you played right, and you may or may not be able to infer what would happen if you played right from what you see when you play left. It depends on your class of model. Okay, so that was as I said, warm up, so we can get to the case of misspecified beliefs. Suppose the true model is not in the support. It was lots of observation, lots of different explanations been offered for this. One is, suppose the agent believes outcomes are independent. Because each period is a, a two components to Y, Y1 and Y2. The agent's prior, it doesn't know the distributions are, it thinks they're independent. All the models I think are possible have an independent. They're actually correlated. Well, the agent's prior assigns probably one to the two things being independent. No amount of data would let them know that they're correlated, because that's one kind of prior that rules out the truth. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see some examples um, after lunch in a paper by Esponda and Cruzo. So there's a paper from the 60s, not this, almost 20 years after Doob, that extends Doob's result to the case of exogenous data, but where the agent is misspecified, where the true model is not in the support of the problem. And that's what I want to talk about next. So I should say that if you look at Burke's paper, it's actually very hard to get the idea of what's going on because he has a continuum of outcomes Y. And so then there's lots of sort of technicalities about tails and well-defined expectations and, and all the stuff which is really, it's just important to have the most general result, but it's not important for the basic fact, but why people are, people ask me, where's this Kublet library versions come from? What's the intuition for the result? The core I, intuition, I think you can see in this much simpler case, I'm sticking with a finite set Y and a finite support prior. Okay. So cool black light with the divergence between model theta and the true model theta hat is defined to be the difference between um, log theta hat, theta hat, that sum, and log theta of y, theta hat. That's, that's the definition. First thing to note, we just went through all the stuff about the um, the second term there with the minus sign. That's the expected log likelihood of what you're going to see. Expected likelihood of the data. People talk about minimizing the cool black library divergence with respect to theta. What model theta minimizes the divergence? This first term with the hats. It's a constant. What data you pick doesn't change that. So minimizing this divergence is the same as maximizing this expected log expected log yeah. okay. So we can view this divergence as a measure of the average inability of model theta to predict the average, predict the real life state. If model theta is theta hat, we've got zero. Otherwise, there's some gap. This is convex function in, in theta. Um, also, if theta and theta prime differ only on events that are probably zero under the true models. So if you 
model state of theta prime in your prior that uh, give different probabilities of things, but the same um, probability of all the things that can actually happen, well then, if one's a minimizer, so is the other, and so is any combination of them. They all fit the data equally well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I the second term looks yeah. like the proper squaring rule, and that should be the integer, right? The um, theta hat is a true probability distribution, yes. and I tell you my guess yeah, over that, and if I guess the truth, it's maximized. Yes, exactly. But that's, that's the intuition for Halbach Leiber. Um, sure, but again, I, mean, I, mean, I think the intuition is this is a likelihood, and this is yeah, what we are yeah. working with in the last proof. I mean, you I can, this is a, a different way of saying um, it's a good intuition. Um, and there's also an intuition that was happening on the, uh, before here, too. So <laughs> the capital theta of theta hat is a function of the truth, be the set of models that minimize the set of models theta in the support of the agents prior that minimize this divergence and assume it's finite. Okay? If the set capital theta is convex, and if the true probability of y is positive for all y, um, uh, the minimizer is unique, but otherwise it need not be. It's, it's a little skip that. The key thing is Burke's result. So before we said the agents beliefs concentrate on the true model, they become a true model. Now we're saying. The agents will least put probably one on the set of KL minimizers. This is a strict generalization of the last result. Because if the true model is in the support, it is the KL minimizer. That's the least divergence you can get is zero. Okay? Here's the theorem. So with finite data, as I'm assuming, the proof is a simple extension of the one I just showed you. In fact, that was the reason to show you that proof before, so you can see how similar it, it is. This is for the case of finite theta. I'm not going to show you what happens in the case where capital theta, say, a, a compact set. But what you have to do then is instead of saying, so we're looking at the likelihood ratio, is it the truth or is it some other k? The analogy would be, let's look at an epsilon ball around the truth and look at the, the odds ratio for, are we in this epsilon ball or outside the epsilon ball? And it's the same kind of idea with a bit of sort of analysis steps about continuity and compactness and so on. It's <laughs> not really okay. So fix any model theta bar that minimizes the KL divergence from the true model. And for any theta k that's not one of the minimizers, this defines zk as the likelihood ratio between theta k and theta bar, given what you've seen up to time t. This is the product tau from one to t, theta k of y tau over theta bar of y tau. Zk t determines the ratio between posterior probability of theta bar and theta. Zk is the exponent of the sum of these marks. Yeah, we should look really familiar. Recall WK, well, it was the log of theta K over theta bar. I can rewrite that as log of theta K over theta hat minus log of theta bar, minus log of theta bar over theta hat. Oh, okay, so this integral, please read this as a sum. It is sort of so. I changed most of them. I mean, I, I, I simplified my slides, but to the finite white case, but not completely. Okay. So, just as we had before, the expectation of WK tau is negative. Same kind of arguments. And again, since the white TRID, the WID, we haven't bounded below, bounded above. We can use a strong law of large numbers to say that with probably one, their average converges to their expected value. 
So P almost surely the sum of these W's converges to minus infinity. So the limit of the Z's is the limit of the expectation of minus infinity is zero. It's the same proof. I just changed theta bar for theta hat. Theta, yeah, exactly, okay? So A just showed why beliefs converge to the KO minimizers. Two, it explains, so people, if you look in the stat literature, or information theory, there's many different divergences, Regman divergence, this divergence, that divergence. People say, why the KL divergence? Well, because it's really it's about likelihood. That this is the thing that matches Bayesian updating. If you're doing Bayesian updating, you want to maximize likelihood. And that turns out to be the sort of same as minimizing KL divergence. Okay? Are we good? Oof, chaos. What, what time is it? And why? Oh, wow. I'm really and I have until uh, okay. okay, take a breath. What do you want? Okay. 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 In this case we have here, where say it's theta is finite, not only do we get to conclude that the least concentrate, but it gives a uniform exponential rate of convergence. It tells us how quickly the least converge. Works more general proof does not give a uniform bound, so uniformly over paths of how quickly the beliefs converge. But um, Giacomo, Lanzani, and Bill Schrock and I have a paper that provides that it extends the work by adding a uniform rate of convergence. So I'm not going to Go through the detail, I think I took those out. Well, it's a, it's a bit, so let me just tell you what the result is. So, first thing we have to make, it doesn't work for any prior. It works for priors that satisfy an additional so called five positivity condition. It basically, it's a, the, the uniform distribution is five positive. Anything that has a density that's strictly positive, except on the boundaries, is five positive. It's kind of a funny name, and you can't blame us for it yet. So there was an earlier paper that gave a uniform concentration bound for correctly specified beliefs. It's a paper by Giaconis and Friedman from the 90s. So in a sense, what we're doing is sort of combining Burke's result on misspecified learning with the Giaconis and Friedman result on um, uniform convergence schemes. Okay. So we end up with a rate of convergence exponential in T and uniform over realizations of the Without the details, just the, here's a high level summary to give you a, a hint of what's involved. Um, so the first thing is nothing to do about Bayesian updating. That's the fact about data. If the probability goes to one at an exponential rate, the empirical distribution of what actually happens looks like the true model. And that's what's called Sanov's theorem, which is these things called concentration inequalities, but how quickly things concentrate around um, their theoretical values. So uh, Sanov's theorem, and then what we then want to show is conditional on this event happening in Sanov's theorem, the belief assigned to any theta outside the KL minimizers drops to zero exponentially fast for reasons that you can sort of see in this. So the same sort of idea. There's more, more steps and more, more things to show. <laughs> okay. Cool. Burke's theorem shows that beliefs converge to a set of KL minimizers. If it's only one KL minimizer, the least converge to a point, we're done. There could be multiple KL minimizers. You might hope that if there's two minimizers, at least converge to say two thirds this one, one third that one. Needn't happen. Okay, so the beliefs can oscillate infinitely often. Here's a simple example. Suppose our outcome that we're seeing is zero, one. Okay, and the true 
the end of generating process is a call to fair coins. So it's 50 50 hit zero and one. Um, the agents prior only has three different models. So the true coin is 50 50. The agent thinks either it's model P, where it's three quarters one and one quarter zero, or it's model two, one quarter one and three quarters zero, or it's model R with one tenth of one and nine tenths of zero. It's, so that's the prior. Well, you, you can see the truth is 50 50. If you can't learn 50 50 because it's not in the prior, but just sort of intuitively, which processes are the best match for 50 50? It's the one quarter, three quarter. So it's, it's P and Q are equally good at matching 50 50, and R is out. So Bert tells us the beliefs are going to put weight only on P and Q. But Bert shows that regardless of the prior on those three point support, the beliefs oscillate between P and Q. And the limb soup of the probability of P is one, but the limb soup of the probability of Q is also one. The beliefs go back and forth and back and forth. Because you know, yes, they're equally good, but sort of a knife edge. And occasionally you get a bit more head, and you'll say, oh, it's got to be model P. And then after a while, they'll be around the tail to think, oh, it's got to be model Q. Okay? So we, in a different paper, generalize that the limb soup of the probability of an epsilon ball about P is one for any KO minimums. So it's just, it's, so for kind of example, this is like, this, this holds more general. Take any P in a set of KO minimizers, we're going to go back and forth. Then anything that's in the neighborhood of a KO minimizer, has limb suit probably one? Harry, you're, you're from. Is there something wrong or unclear? Is there a quantifier on the prior? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, let's stick for now with mutual absolute continuity assumption. We have weaker assumptions in the papers. It is, it's, so basically, yeah. starting from any arbitrary prior, yeah. uh, the limb soup has to be one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and as we'll see when we get to um, this uh, paper, Beckham and Philip, suppose that the distribution of outcomes depends on the agent's action. Okay? Well, then how can you converge to always plain action one? Well, then this action had been, if your beliefs are gonna go back and forth in P and Q, you mm -hmm. will always play action one, Action one had better be a best response to both P and Q. It's not enough to be a best response to one of them because eventually beliefs will drift away. <clears throat> That's good. Um, so maybe you're not surprised that beliefs oscillate when agents are correctly or misspecified. But um, if you go to more complicated models with like real valued outcomes instead of finite, um, and they just correctly specified, you can still get oscillations. So now once Y is infinite, then your priors aren't these nice finite dimensional vectors. They're infinite dimensional objects. So in their example, the data generating process is in real value location experiment. There's an unknown new. Each period you see new plus epsilon t. Okay? And they consider priors that are common in Bayesian statistics. The agent doesn't know new. They have a normal prior on new. And there's a beta distribution on these errors. Okay? And a Cauchy measure on the beta parameter. And what I guess the reason one reason I'm mentioning this is this is sometimes this is one of the arguments for misspecification. That if you have a rich enough set of models, all models are possible, you know, then true models end, they're not misspecified. But if Y is infinite, the space of all models is huge, if, if, and it can be very hard to learn what's going on. And 
in this case for y is infinite. Okay. Beliefs us. Even the agents correctly specify beliefs us. So th this is one reason why a statistician might consider a restricted class of models. But then if you restrict a class of models, you risk being misspecified. So that's that's what I um I wanted to say about um beliefs and specify beliefs in learning this morning. Um any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a related topic now. It's um different, another really important idea from probability theory that's been used in the literature on specified learning. So one reason to talk about it is because I'm going to make mention to it in the afternoon. But I think it's really um, important on its own. So like for the students in the audience, um, you know, you probably heard of Martingales. You may have heard of the Martingale convergence theorem. You may or may not have seen a proof. Um, but the thing you may well not have seen is this idea of upcrossings of super Martingales. Which has proved to be very useful. So I'm, I'm going to, and in the spirit of teaching useful probability theory, so not going to see economics, I'm going to talk about um, Martingale upcrossings. And um, in addition to being used in the learning work I'll talk about this afternoon, these upcrossings have also been used in literature on reputation, as in uh, a paper of mine with David Levine, and also uh, a paper of Harry's. People in our heritage, he's, he's here in the audience. He's, he's, he's also using drug crossings. So you can correct me on, on, on my mistakes in the proof. Okay. So consider a filtered probability space, state space omega. Um, and we, we have this collection of sigma algebras, telegraphic Fn, which is what the agent knows at time n. I, I have this word filtration. What does that mean? It means you don't forget. And, Anything you knew at the end, also know it period on plus one, you could know more. Okay? That means calligraphic F is just a union of all the calligraphic F N. So we'll say that a stochastic process Xn is adapted to the filtration if it's Fn measurable. So you could, you can, if Fn is what the agent knows at time n, the agent knows the value of Xn, period. A stopping time is a random variable tau with integer values, possibly infinite. So when you stop this process, and it has to be adapted to the filtration. So it's like it's not fair to say, I'm going to gamble on this coin, and I'm going to keep on gambling as long as it comes up heads. And once it comes up tails, okay, I didn't bet that point, and I, and I can quit. So you can only make your bets dependent on what you've seen so far. A super martingale is an adapted stochastic process which has a finite expectation and which drifts down. The expectation of xn plus 1 given x1 through xn is less than or equal to xn. So you haven't heard of the martingales, the expected value of xn plus 1 equals xn. So there's two obvious cases. It can go up, it can go down. Why is super martingale down and not up? Reasons. I don't know. Okay, it's just, that's, that's the word. Good. But up crossing for any real interval, a, b, the up crossing number u, n, a, b, which depends on the realization of the process omega, is the number of up crossings made by state f. What's an up crossing? Well, to up cross A, B, you have to be below A and go above A, okay? So S1 is gonna be the first, first time that we're below A. And then T1 is the first time we're above B. So you go from below A to above B, that's not crossing. And then maybe it never happens. Maybe we cross B and go up to infinity. Maybe, but we could go from A to B, back below A, and back over B. Then we have two up crossings. We have three up crossings. So the up crossing number is how many times we cross from A to B. And it depends on, you know, by some given time n. So 
The longer we go, the more crossing it can't be less than could be more. So U n is how many up crossings by time n. U infinity is how many up crossings ever. Good. Definition good? Good. So the theorem I want to show you is called Dubin's upcrossing inequality. So the probability that there are k or more upcrossings, probably u infinity is greater than or equal to k, is no more than the ratio a over b to the k times the minimum of x naught over a and 1. A is less than b. So a over b to the k is smaller and smaller as k gets bigger. This is telling you, in a sense, this is a decreasing probability of more and more upcrossings. And in particular, as k goes to infinity, there's probably zero of infinite upcrossings. Okay. It's sort of intuitive, right? This, if the process is drifting down. If the process drifted up, who knows? Or if it was, if it was neutral, if it's drifting down, you think it can't go up and down so many times. Okay? So to help put this in perspective, it's useful to think of it as just a generalization of Markov's law. Which you probably saw in your very first probability class. So Markov's law says if we have a real value random variable k, the probability that y is more than k is no more than the expected value of y over. K. Expect value of y is you know at least as much as if we take y times this indicator function of y being more than k, we're basically putting zero when it's less than k and then y. So it's clear that this is less than this. And there's a picture. So, so that's k, k times in, indicator of y more than k is the blue line. And that's less than y times the indicator by more than k, which is the orange line. So we have this, and we just take expectations of everything, and here we go. That's Markov's law. People have seen this before? Question mark? Yes, no, not or wait. Some people, yes, some people no. Okay. So Here's the Steuben's inequality. So the idea of it is that because X is a super martingale, the probability of moving from below A to above B, given we're below A, is at most A over B as a Markov's law. And then we're just going to repeatedly apply that. So we probably have if we're below A, we probably we go above to so most A over B. How left is it we go from A over B back down and back up again? Well, intuitively, it should be no more than A over B squared. So that's, that's the idea. And so ordinarily, when I would teach this, I would stop there. But because this is um, meant to really show you how things work and understand here stopping times and martingales, I'm going to attempt the proof. It's a little, it's not complicated. It's, it's no fancy theorems, but it's, it's involved. So let me let me go slow and see if I can manage to get it across. It'll always succeed. Okay. So a one lemma is really useful in proving this. So if x1 and x2 are two different positive super martingales, and v is a stopping time where we at this time we stop, x1 is at least as big as x2 then we can find a new process that says, take x1 until the stopping time and then switch to x2. So that's also a positive super martingale. It's pretty intuitive. You have this thing, which is super martingale, positive super martingale, so it's positive and expectation is always going down. And at some martingale time, stopping time, we'll switch to something that's no higher. And then that new thing is also super martingale. So we have a super martingale, switch to something lower and do a new super so it's, it's still super martin. Okay, so that's, that's a key lemma. Pretty intuitive. 
So you know, is this okay? If I go too fast, please, the whole point of this is to explain the proofs, not just assert things. Okay. So how are we going to use that? So here's where it gets complicated. Try and see. So I'm going to find stopping times by when x n crosses below a or above b. So v1 is the first time that x n is below a. V2 is the first time after v1 when x is above b. So if we start at the above b, that doesn't count. We have to first be below a and then be above b. V3 is the first time we're below a after v2. Okay, so these are the times that we're crossing our two bounds. Now fix a number k, and I'm going to define a new process where what I'm going to do is the ith time we get above b, I'm going to truncate the process and replace it with b over a to the i. Okay. So if we start off um, at times before, before v1, when we aren't yet below a, I will define this to be 1. Okay. From then on, from B1 up to B2, we have Xn over A. So we're down below A, this is some number less than 1. The minute that we get to B2, when Xn gets up to um, B, we stop and say, okay, now it says B over A. And we stay at B over A until we get back down below A again, and then we go B over A, X1 over A. So this is a, a new process. It's pulled out of the air. Yeah. So what I, I want to convince you is this new process is a super martingale. So let's check. So let Z1 be identically 1. Let Z2 be Xn over A. So if we switch from 1 to x1 over a at time z1, what well, we're switching to a lower super martingale. So 1 is a trivial super martingale of the super martingale. We switch to So this, this process, we switch from z1 to z2, is a positive super martingale. Let z3 be b over a. If we switch from z2 to z3 at time b2, we have a new super martingale. So each step, we have a, a super martingale. So this whole thing, Yn, is a super martingale. What is it? Here's the slide that, 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 that gets me hung up. It's a little dense. Let me go slow. If, X, if we start off with x not over a more than 1, then it's y0 by definition is 1. If x not over a is less than one, then y not is x not over a. So our y not, this new variable I define, at time zero, its initial value y zero is the minimum of one and x not over a. And it's a constant, so it, it equals this expectation. We said that yn is a super martingale. Well, that means this expectation of yn is no more than expectation of y zero. Okay. Expectation of yn is at most the minimum of one x not over a. So that was important that yn is a super martingale. Okay. So the claim is then that the probability to fix a um, we already fixed a k. Look at time n. Okay. What's the probability that there have been no more than two k up crossings by time n? Okay. Well, it's at least this a over b the k times the min of y naught and x naught over a.
Sorry, your question? There was someone asking question. Oh, please. Oh, no, that. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. The best is I'll add that N, I'll let Ken size. So, and maybe, and it's still some probability would get smaller and smaller in K. And what is the probability there is a finite number of up crossings? Well, it's just the, there have to be, um, B2K is the time of the case of crossing. What? Sorry? Oh, I think that would be too hard. Now it works. Good, yeah. Um, B2K is the time of the case of crossing. We want to say that it's finite. So that's the same as so Harry's nodding, so I convinced him. I I I know from experience this is this this is this is hard to follow. Is it um, does anyone have any useful questions? Or is everyone nodding or am I just overly worried? I, but I've thought this before, like half the people have gotten it, half the people haven't gotten it. So I'm not it's, it's okay. It, it's not at least you see the main idea, which is we have this. You know, I mean, the, the idea is just falling back on repeated use of um, Markov's law, and then this idea that if we replace some super martingale with the lower one, it's still super martingale, and then some careful counting and notation. Um, I, was, you know, I have a question. Yeah, so can, you show, can you show me the definition of the super mounting bill? Yes. Yeah. Let me find. Yeah. Going backwards, I think. Yeah. Yes. That's not, so, <clears throat> do you define this as a condition expectation given the x1 to xn or given the filtration fn? So, which? This uh, last line. Yeah. Well, yes. This is obviously, this was a condition expectation, yeah? Sure, but the uh, conditional on x1 to xn instead of conditional on fn. Yes. So is it, is it the definition that you use here? I think so, yeah. I think so. Then, then in that case, I think the, the sound argument is a bit non trivial to me. The, so, when you construct a new super mounting gale, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if that's the super mounting gale according to this definition uh, because you forget some of the information. Used from the previous process. That's not relevant. Uh, given x and x, uh, given x n and y n, we construct a new process. But and then the new process is going to forget some of the information about x and y. So to show the new process is a super mind Okay. So the evolution of the y. Didn't depend, there were two different processes. So, so, so yes, so why is those super, super running go? Looking at why, you won't know the trust values of x, but they don't matter anymore for the evolution. So we have a variable which is this following y. So, yes, you've, you've forgotten about x's, but you don't need to know the x's to know what's happening to y. Stay okay. But the, the new process Z you constructed will forget some of the information from X and some of the information from Y. Sorry, I'm not. No, so, so, uh, so um, I'm talking about this lemma. So, V <laughs> follows X after time V, and then follows X1, then follows X2. 
when it follows x2, it forgets x1, but it doesn't need to know. But when we follow x2, yeah. z doesn't remember x2 earlier before switching to x2. He knows x1 and he knows x2 right but uh, the x2 is super nothing girl conditional on knowing x2 I... so uh, i i guess okay, if you fix one uh filtration i think that the argument is fine okay. and uh, that's a little stronger comment than the, i think i i don't know so that I, I, I think that the, 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 this the proof of this theorem is, should be fine. Yes. But I think that the, the lemma that we use, uh, I think that is applied to a uh, uh, special classes of supermodules, not for this uh, general class of supermodules defined in that way. Could be. I mean, you're saying you may have to be careful how you define the filtration to make this work. So I'm not sure you're right. You could be right, but as you say, it's not going to matter. So, okay. Uh, but thank you. Okay, so I have, please, yeah. Oh, I have a question about the relationship between the intuition and the proof of the dubit approaching. Oh, yeah. In the intuition, uh, we, we have seen that the probability of moving from A to above B is at most A, A over, B. over B. Yeah. However, in the proof, we don't, we don't see the probability Going from A and B. Yeah, but like we in the proof, we use what the uh, uh, probability for the Y. That's right. It's, so the intuition is not the same as the proof. You're right. I mean, the proof is just a way of formalizing the idea. I think the, the intuition tells you why it's true. But it's, but it's not, but it's, but I can't write that intuition and say it's a proof. So you want to prove you have to say you know, we follow these steps and we can bound things. So it, 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 you're right, it's, it's not transparently the same. I mean, it's, it's hiding in there with these, when we truncate in, we get these bounds, and they, but it's, 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 it's a little obscure. Um, it's the simplest proof I could find. Um, okay, so half an hour, is that right? Yeah. So, let me tell you how this is used in reputation literature. Okay. Suppose there's a long run player one who is facing an infinite sequence of short run player twos, which he plays only once. In each period, they simultaneously choose actions. So the pure actions are A1 and A2, and the mixed actions are alpha one and alpha two. And the theorem is much more general than this, but I'm, I, I, I'm going to simplify by assuming that each period, players observe the actions that are played, as opposed to getting some signal of the actions that were played. Okay. The player twos are short run players to my open. So each day, the short run players do whatever sequences that period's payoff, given what they think player one is going to do. Okay. For people who know this, this is an extension or a generalization of a, of a result of Krebs and Wilson and Logan Roberts about you can get a reputation for playing like a given type if it's in the support of the prior. So they do this in very special cases, strong assumptions. Levine and I had an 89 paper to prove this for the case of reputation for playing a pure action. And reputation for playing a pure action and as opposed to computing the equilibrium the way Krebs and Wilson do, it's a very simple argument that says a patient long run player can get the Stackerberg payoff, which is suppose you always play this action. What's going to happen? Some periods, children players play best response to your action, you get Stackerberg payoff, you're happy. Some periods, children players don't play best response to your action, it could be bad. How could they not play a best response to your stack reaction? They must think you're not going to play it. Well, if they think it's unlikely you're playing this action, they think the problem is only half, and you play it, then they have to update their beliefs by some positive amount. And it's very easy to see that it can only be like a finite number of times you can get surprised. Because each time your posterior, if you thought the probability of seeing this, if the guy 
wasn't the crazy type was only a half. That's probably one. If he's crazy and you keep on seeing it, then after 10 periods or 20 periods, you're sure it's, it's, it's the crazy. That's the easy case. It's usually not optimal to commit to playing a pure action. Usually you can do better by committing to playing a mixed action, like a firm that wants to get people to buy its goods. So you can commit to make high quality, always play high quality, people buy your goods. You always make low quality, no one buys your goods. The best thing is you commit to sometimes make high quality, just often enough that people buy the goods that you can save money. So you'd like to commit to a mixed strategy. But now the proof is more complicated because if your strategy is 50, 50 high and low quality, then what you do is stochastic. And you can't just mechanically say after 10 periods, the short run players have decided you're a crazy type. It's a stochastic process. So we use a different argument. Okay. So I'm going to do this argument now. So there's a rational type theta star player one that's like the normal guy, wants to maximize um, spectrum utility, a discount factor delta. That D of alpha one be the actions for player two that are best responses to alpha one for player one. It's the usual best response now. And B epsilon of alpha one is all the alpha twos that are best response to some alpha one prime that is close to alpha one. And so many people, you're playing alpha one and people think you're playing something a little bit away. So then more things might be best response. The intuition behind the reputation literature that a player one is patient and there's some prior probability that they're the stack of type they should be able to get the payoff of being the stack of type. type. Okay? So let alpha one star be a stack of work action, an element of the, look at the arg max of player one's utility function, given player two plays the best response. That would be on the star, but here it is. This is the max, alpha one star is an element of the arg max. To model the possibility of, of reputation for playing stack of work, Suppose there's a positive prior probability that player one is a stack of verb type omega bar that always plays alpha one star. And this type is private information. Player one knows it, the player two don't. There's some prior about it. And to simplify, so the paper allows a very general prior, but easy case. The short run players think there's only two types of the short of, of player one. Either they're the rational type theta star or with this particular type omega star. Okay. So standard result, this game has a Nash equilibrium. And what I want to do is lower bound the payoff of the long run play. So that W of delta be the infimum, the least lower bound of the long run players, the rational types payoff over all the Nash equilibrium. Well, the Nash equilibrium depends on the discount factor. So, so all the Nash equilibria for a given discount factor. And that U1 lower bar, player one's low, worst payoff. It's finite games, that's a finite number. And that U1 of epsilon be the infimum over all the alpha twos that are best responses to the Stackelberg action. So the word, this is your payoff if the player one's, player twos, they could be indicated with multiple best responses. Pick the one you like least. And just for good luck, subtract out an extra epsilon. So the theorem is that for any epsilon, there exists a number k, so I'll just count factors delta. This worst Nash equilibrium payoff is bounded below by the sum of two terms. Okay. One term has this terrible payoff, you run lower bar. So it's multiplied by something that goes to zero as delta goes to one. Importantly, as delta goes to one, this k doesn't change. So if you take delta to one, this term goes to zero. And the other term is this conservative estimate of a Stackelberg pair. What's the worst you can get when people play a best response to alpha one star? So, 
Uh, so proof well. Fix a Nash equilibrium. That determines a probability distribution over what people will see. And in equilibrium, the short player should be spatial updating from the posterior beliefs and over any history. Now, we're not going to solve the Nash equilibrium. We're bounding the payoff. So we don't know what the equilibrium is. But one thing player one could do is always play off one star. They don't have to do that. They could do that. Okay? Importantly, he said there's a positive prior probability that player one was a type that always played off one star. So if player one chooses to play off one star, that's like the true model for showing players. So we player two sh believes should concentrate on that one. That, that's our, our expectation. Okay? I'm not saying that player two's learn player one's the commitment type. You can imagine that what's called a pooling equilibrium. Suppose the rational type and the commitment type both play off one star all the time. Then there's no date. People don't change their beliefs. But the theorem doesn't say that short run players learn your long run players the commitment type. It says long run player gets like a payoff. If the short run players think that both types play off of one star, of course they play a best response to off one star. So how does the proof go? Fix an epsilon and a delta and say a period is bad if the short run players don't play a best response to alpha one star. We're going to element as the epsilon of alpha one star. And we want to bound how many bad periods there are. And so I said, if, if alpha one star was a pure strategy, it's easy. There's a fixed number k, depends on the prior computed simply. But here, the number of bad periods is stochastic because you're, you're mixing high and low quality. We don't know what's going to happen if you, if you do that. Okay? So let's study the evolution of the short player beliefs in the bad periods only. Short run players are playing best responses to up on start. So that means they're playing something different. In the good periods, the long run player gets a good payoff. The intuition of the proof is that in the bad periods, short run players should be surprised. They didn't play a best response to off star, they saw it. They should increase the probability they assign to Omega star. So the intuition is there shouldn't be, should be unlikely there are many of these devices. People should update towards Omega star anytime they didn't expect to see Alpha star. So you want to show there can't be too many surprises unless the probability of omega star is high enough, all per later periods are good. Okay. So it's a, a not quite immediate because the, the rational type is not ID. We don't know what the rational type strategy is because of what's happened so far. We can't do anything what the equilibrium is, but there's a gamma to set for all bad periods. Um, there's a difference between alpha one star and beta star. And importantly, under alpha one star, this odds ratio is a positive super martingale. Okay? And we can use Dubin's inequality to show the following that for any L lower bar greater than zero and epsilon, there's a time where the probability that the soup of the odds ratio is less than a lower bar is greater than one minus epsilon. So it's really likely that the beliefs go down, okay? or it's unlikely there's many bad periods. And so what's going on, every time we, we have a surprise, this things move, it's like, it's like an up crossing. And you can use the up crossing bound to prove this thing. So you know, I like this, this theorem because the intuition for the result is linked to the proof itself. Okay. People will get surprised. Either play a best response to Stockelberg or get surprised. And there shouldn't be many surprises. But I should alert you that after our paper, there's a proof by Gosner, which is actually simpler, but does not use up crossing numbers. 
instead uses discounted expected entropy and, and some telescoping series arguments to prove the same theorem. And it has an advantage over our result, which is that if actions are imperfectly observed, which is not the case that I proved in the slide, just covered in the paper, that are identified, meaning that different actions lead to different distributions over signals, then Gilson and result not only proves the theorem, but gives a convergence rate. That how quickly do the payoffs converge to Stockerberg is the rate one minus delta. And our paper didn't give a rate. So um, that part of the theorem is better than our theorem. On the other hand, if we have an extensive form game, then the long run player's action isn't identified. Like, so if the, if the long run player's action is like higher or low quality, but we only see the quality if someone buys the good, and sometimes consumers don't buy, and then we can't tell what the long run player is doing, actions aren't identified. So our theorem still holds that we have a lower bound. Goldsmith's theorem holds, but it's really hard to use. If you look at this paper, he bounds the payoff as the least convex function that's underneath these complicated functions of delta, and it's very hard to compute what that is. So it's, it, in some cases, one theorem is better, in some cases, it is. Okay, so I have 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, so um, I showed you one use of up crossings. Let me mention um, not too much detail. Um, on last use of up crossings, so you, as, as I uh, claimed at the start, I, I expected many of you at least heard of the Martingale convergence theorem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a different up crossing argument you can do is used to prove this theorem. Okay. So the Dubin's result that I showed you bounded the probability of more than k up crossings. Dubin's result bounds the expected value of a number of up crossings. Okay, so x be a super martingale, then the expected value of a number of up crossings is no more than the expectation of the max of zero and a minus x n. So if the soup n of xn is finite, then there's almost surely a finite um, number of up crossings. But, but it's, huh? What is the Martingale convergence theorem? That x be a super Martingale with the supremum expected value of x finite. Almost surely the limit of Xn exists and is finite. I apologize that having this at the end of the lecture because it's, it's another dense couple of slides. So let's try and talk slow. Um, so to find capital gamma AB be the set of states omega where the lim inf of Xn of omega is less than A. Is less, which is like the picking numbers A and B, A less than B, and well, then soup is more. Then we set capital, um, not a gamma, that's a capital lambda. lambda, capital lambda, where Xn does not converge to a limit. Okay, well, that's just the set where the limit n is different than the limit soup. Well, that's the union over all rationals A and B of the limit of Xn being less than A and the limb soup being more than B. So it doesn't converge, there has to be two rationals in between the limit and the limb soup. But the set for that, where the limit the limb soup is a subset of a set of states with an infinite number of upcrossings. And by Duke's upcrossing lemma, this is zero. So the probability of capital lambda is zero. So the limit of Xn exists. Okay. And 
we want to show it's finite. Okay, well, this limit exists, so the expectation of x infinity is the expectation of the limit because the limit exists. Um, now, what I want to do is interchange the expectation and the limit operator. And I can do that using the two's lemma. And the theorem assumed that the supremum here was finite. So that implies that the probability that x infinity is finite is one. We have a limit, it's a finite limit. Corollary, if x is a positive for martingale, and the expectation of xn is less than x is not. So once again, things are necessary. There's a limit for martingales and a limit for positive super martingales. Same. And all goes back to upcrossing numbers. So upcrossing numbers, they're sort of technical device, but they're super useful. Um, and we'll see some more of them um, after lunch. So that, that, that's, that's what I had for the day, except to uh, huh? remind you what the two's lemma says. And the slides are on the web for the students. Um, good, so any questions? And I should say, if, you have, if people have questions, that not, it's one thing to forget, but no, oh, never mind. I'll say it later, you go ahead, please ask. Oh, okay. Um, so th thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm, I have a question on the um, size of the, of, of the oscillation in beliefs. Going back, take the whole one. Yes. So, so you provided. Whole... Sorry. Yeah. Let me get to the slide first. Yes. yes. And this, this is actually two different slides on oscillation in beliefs. I right. have two. I have the infinite location one and the one of Burke. I mean, the Burke one or the, or the other one? Uh, Burke one. Please. Okay. Good, good, good. So. Uh... Yes, yes, yes. So in, in this in this setting, yes. um, this agent is like smart enough to like do the agent updating, but ended up in like back and forth updating between model P and model Q. So it is there any possibility that that, that agent can like update the priors? I mean. Uh, how, how should we understand that? I mean, how should we just justify this settings? Great question. And this comes up a lot in model um, in looking at models and the specified beliefs. So shouldn't the agent realize something screwy is going on? That's what you're saying. Um, and that's point one. And point two, you said, could the agent update their beliefs to change? So point one, totally. They, in many cases, you think they would notice, especially when it's so simple and obvious. However, there's no way a Bayesian can update their beliefs to notice to change things. It's simply not possible. There's the mechanics of Bayes' rule. You are unable to assign positive probability to something you initially thought was impossible. Mm -hmm. So if you want to allow, if you want to model people rejecting their model or the prior, you have to step somewhat outside of Bayesian expected utility. And there are papers that try and do this. I'm not going to talk about this, but Jocko and I have a paper in theoretical economics uh, called Which Misperceptions Persist that has a non Bayesian evolutionary model that says, okay, how might, you know, how and when might people throw out their models? He yeah. said, you, you come in society, your, your parents say, here's the prior, go off, look at the data, see what you think, and you say, oh, but these models don't fit so well. Yeah. So we say sometimes there'll be a mutation where people say, oh, here's I think here's some new models that I think are possible. The question is, when will this new prior displace the old one? Okay. So first of all, if you consider some new models to fit the data worse, that can't help. But a bit more interesting, even if your model fits the data better, it still might not take over. Why not? Because a model that fits the data better might lead you to, to have worse payoff. Because if it fits data better but isn't fully correct, then you use the model to extrapolate. So I've been doing action three, and here's a new model that fits data better. If this action four is better, action four could be worse. So 
it, the new, we said in, in the, the model has to also lead you to get a better payoff. We have some discussion of this. So, so that's that's one paper. And there's also a paper by Josh Schwartzstein and um, this uh, Daniel Barsh and Rabin that has a, this model, light bulbs go off in people's heads and they realize maybe some models different. So there, there are some papers on this. And then lastly, um, Giacomo's job market paper was a, um, in a sense, more sophisticated model, kind of of a sort, where they starts off not being Bayesian. They're ambiguity averse. They have a set of models and they, they don't maximize EU, they maximize a kind of variational preference. And then the weight they put it, fear of, fear of misspecification varies with the data. So they're not really introducing new models, but they have this big set, but they don't think anything works anyway, but it's not Bayesian. So, Short answer, Bayesian can't update to add new things. So you need to step out of Bayesianism because it's evolutionary, so you can do it with prop effective utility. You have to do something outside the box. Um, very good. Um, then lastly, there's a, some misperceptions like this one seems so simple, people should surely notice. There's ex examples of people using misspecified learning models in macro. You know, Macro, like a true model of the economy, zillions of things that matter for the evolution of GDP, some small amounts, some, for sure every model anyone uses is misspecified, but how would you, you wouldn't hope that a fully specified one is it. So again, how do you deal with the fact your model might be misspecified? And that's a, a motivation for the, um, this work of Hansen and Sargent on robust control in macro. They say people know their model's probably not right and they maximize you, know, you you maximize. Uh, well, I don't want to give a lecture on 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 the West control, but that would be next time I visit. I can do that. Good question. Um, other questions? Again, I'm happy to take questions. Like you know, more general questions as well as very specific small questions. Just a. More question related to this uh, oscillation. So yeah. Did you say that the, the actually the limits of this belief like both the one? And uh, you, I, I kind of found it to be quite surprising. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it takes a proof. It's, in the, it's an arm result. So the, um, so work shows this. So actually, we extend it, but it's, 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 yeah. So, um, it is surprising, but it, I don't know. What, so. It's not easy to get the intuition. Uh, I don't have. Um, maybe if I maybe it so happens that the ratio of zero and one is exactly very close to three four and one. That happens. Yeah. So again, again, so the oscillation maybe it's a partial answer. Also, so as I said when I presented this, if there's a unique KL minimizer. There can't be oscillations, so you you might think, oh, the um, having multiple minimizers is a knife edge. But it's weird. So, and here in the simple example that I'm showing you, maybe it seems weird. I have an example I'll show you after lunch of where the fact there's two minimizers maybe seems less weird, and we'll see it then. But intuitively, if you you, if you your prior imposes some symmetry conditions, that's in a sense non-generic, and, and those symmetry conditions can lead to there being multiple minimizers. So let's use this example. There's an unknown number of balls in an urn. Now it's just six balls in an urn, three possible colors, and you don't know the composition, but you're sure at least ha half of them are white, and and, not, and then you don't know how many are blue and green, and then if the truth is that not half of them are white, but you know less than you're misspecified, but you can be equally misspecified different ways. So we'll see that one. But again, as, as Mitchie says, it's in a sense it's a knife edge. If it's not generic in some big sense of all measures, you have multiple minimizers. On the other hand, if you have some structural Restrictions like symmetry or independence, those are also not generic. And those sort of restrictions can lead to multiple minimizers. A bunch of multiple minimizers, okay, 
then in a sense, things are kind of fragile because they both fit equally well. So this that variation in the data and you know, sometimes one happens, sometimes the other happens. And, and if, um, yeah, that's, that's is that, is that all? Yeah. Well, okay, let's let's stop and um hopefully some of you come back um after lunch.